Thank you for joining the very first FSDC Industry Exchange Series. As part of our policy advocacy work at FSDC, we would like to broaden our engagement with the financial services industry on topics of strategic importance through the Industry Exchange Series. The topic for today's discussion is whether Hong Kong can be a fund domicile of, for all. Well, regulatory framework, tax regime, and market potential are the three main pillars affecting the competitiveness of an asset management center. With rising competition among our peers, does Hong Kong have what it needs to compete and stay on top? I'm delighted to have with us four distinguished panel speakers. On my left is Ms. Christina Choi from the SFC. In the middle is Mrs. Florence Yip from PwC Hong Kong. The third on the left, um, is Mr. Franco Nang from Seal Asset Management. On the far end is Jeremy Nilam from Deacons. I would also like to thank the seven supporting organizations today, namely AMA, Chinese Asset Management Association of Hong Kong, Hong Kong ICPA, Hong Kong IFA, uh, Hong Kong SI, Hong Kong VCA, and TMA. About the flow of discussion today, the panelists will share their views on whether the latest open-ended funds and limited partnership fund developments, together with the unified tax exemption for funds regime and other opportunities in Hong Kong, can make the city a private funds domicile of choice. Following the discussion will be the Q&A session. The audience can type in their questions uh, in the chat box uh, of the Zoom system. I'll direct the questions to our speakers. Well, let's start our discussion with the OFC regime first. Uh, Christina, yes. can you please explain the rationale for introducing the OFC regime to us and how SFC regulates the private OFC? Sure. I think, as you all know, Hong Kong is, is a very successful uh, asset management hub now. And, and it is part of, I think, the efforts of the government, the SFC and all the industry uh, and market participants to really help develop Hong Kong into a more full service uh, fund management, domicile and, and administrative uh, center. So I think, in, in, as you know, we have been very successful for public funds to be a key, um, you know, premier uh, distribution center. And for private funds, we have, you know, a, a many, many different types of private funds uh, managers here. So it would be good, you know, for, for Hong Kong to really also um, expand its uh, capabilities in, in uh, being, you know, manufacturing funds and no need to go to the offshore um, jurisdictions like, you know, as some of the, you're, you're very familiar, Cayman and, and other places. And with the, I think the OECD uh, in economic substance policy initiative. So actually it's driving a more an alignment of the fund management uh, uh, hub and the fund domicile, hmm. you know, so that, you know, th this could be more economical and also for the better development of Hong Kong uh, moving towards a uh, different level of uh, services. And in, in a way, I think this is the first time um, we have this uh, corporate uh, with the COP, OFC is a corporate uh, fund structure, which is actually quite uh, familiar to a lot of international investors. And in the past, we only have unit trusts. Mm. And, and so with actually a corporate uh, fund structure, which is more flexible, then we can really, you know, um, help to promote uh, Hong Kong as a fund domicile. And in, in relation to the process, I, I think we do fully recognize that actually for private funds, they are offered to professional mm -hmm. investors. So the requirement is that actually you must be uh, have a type nine uh, license here. So if you are managing already in Hong Kong, then I, I think you are already subject to SFC supervision anyway. And the, and the fund manager code of conduct is, is applicable. So in a way, whether you are managing a an offshore Cayman fund or a Hong Kong fund, it should, you know, make very little difference from a conduct or a regulatory perspective. And so our key focus is mainly, you know, also uh, for the process to be quite um, smooth and, and, and streamlined for the private funds. 
And the key actually focus that we have been looking at is mainly the fund manager, the directors, and also custodian. And, and in relation to the, the fund setup, we just focus on the, like the instrument of incorporation to make sure there are some minimum uh, the statutory provisions are there. So we try to make it very um, streamlined. And, and recently we have expanded the investment scope because mm -hmm. actually since we have launched um, uh, the regime in, um, I think in the summer of 2018, we heard a lot about um, from the private uh, fund manager side, they want more flexibility in terms of the investment scope and also for the custodian, you know, um, because actually they would like to have some prime brokers uh, to be the custodian and instead of a traditional bank or, or, or trust company. So uh, we have just, you know, finished um, amending the code. So this would also facilitate um, the use by uh, private funds uh, to use the OFC structure. Oh, oh, thank you, uh, Christine, um, uh, for the uh, informative clarification of the uh, OFC regime. Uh, for instance, I understand the uh, IRD issued an interpretation and practice notes on profit tax exemption for funds in June this year. Uh, would you please give us an update um, on the con on the current tax position regarding OFCs? Yeah, yeah. Um, in in fact, the old tax exemption law for a private OFC has been completely replaced. Conditions that are difficult to fulfill, for example, uh, non-closely held or the non-qualifying transactions cannot exceed 10% of the OFC's total asset value are no longer applicable. In, in that, um, this new unified fund exemption effective April 2019 is extremely user friendly and the conditions are extremely, I would say, easy to fulfill for a private OFC with a Hong Kong fund manager holding a pipeline license. First of all, the good news is such an OFC is exempt from profit tax. Very, very good news. The only a point that um, the manager need to be aware of is should a private OFC engages in direct trading or direct business undertaking in non-qualifying transactions, then only the Hong Kong source profit from such transactions will be subject to profit tax. So that means if the OFC conducts a qualifying transaction, uh, then there would be no um, tax at all, or if it conducts non calling fund transactions, but the profits are not uh, Hong Kong source, that's also fine. Now, the uh, IRD DIPN actually uh, 61 issued uh, in June this year actually confirmed this position. And not only that, um, it has also um, um, clarified that uh, investment funds, including open ended fund company, can apply for Hong Kong tax resident certificate. Mm -hmm. Now, this is very important because for a fund manager who wants to get a benefit of the treaty network that Hong Kong has with um, almost 40 countries or territories, that an investment fund can get a Hong Kong tax resident certificate, a uh, uh, tax resident status is extremely important. Um, the DIPN 61, um, all also um, have some uh, comments on the set of losses. So in case um, the o private OFC that engages in um, non-qualifying transactions that generates losses, such losses would only be able to be carried forward against the profit from such specified activity in the future. So, um, so I would hope that with uh, the private OFC, um, the fund manager would uh, find it uh, very user friendly, very practical, and also uh, can do business not only within Hong Kong, but also make investments um, outside Hong Kong as well. Oh, thank you for the encouraging update, uh, Foreign. Now, uh, Jeremy, now that we have a very supportive regulatory regime and taxation framework for private funds, would you advise your client to utilize the OFC structure and what issues? do they need to consider in making such decision? Thank you, King. Um, I would say in general, there are about 10 factors that uh, fund managers need to consider when they are choosing a fund domicile and perhaps a, even a sort of a fund structure. And, I, and I'd like to just take, take you through those. 
uh, I think the first one is establishment and ongoing maintenance costs. I mean, costs generally, we're in a very cost competitive environment right now. Um, and particularly for the, maybe the sort of the smaller or startup managers, cost is going to be a key thing. Um, so of course you have uh, legal fees, which I would hope are reasonable, but just putting aside the legal fees for one minute, <laughs> the other costs, uh, and to give you some sort of comparison with, uh, let's say Cayman is an offshore jurisdiction. So uh, as I said, so this is putting aside legal fees, but for, for the OFC structure, if you're gonna have a standalone structure, the administrative costs uh, payable to the government uh, government bodies here uh, in relation to the establishment and the filing is going to be about, is under 10,000 Hong Kong dollars. Uh, if you're going to set up a, uh, a standalone Cayman structure, the, 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 the comparable cost is around 80,000 uh, Hong Kong dollars in terms of incorporation expenses and filing fees that need to be made to the, uh, to the Cayman authorities. With a, an umbrella structure uh, in Hong Kong, you're looking at uh, establishment costs in the region of 15,000, that's one five, 15,000 Hong Kong, uh, and that's with one sub fund. In the, in the Cayman, you're looking at around 90,000 Hong Kong. So there is actually a, a quite a significant differential in the, in the costs. Uh, in terms of ongoing, obviously there's an ongoing uh, regulatory filings that need to be made in the relevant jurisdiction. Uh, if you're looking at uh, sort of Cayman, you uh, standalone, you're looking at about 73,000 in terms of on annual filings that need to be made versus uh, Hong Kong, which basically is zero at the moment in terms of the cost of the filing. Uh, and for a, uh, an umbrella structure in the Cayman Islands, you're looking at around about, give or take 100,000 Hong Kong dollars. These are just approximations, please. Um, and again, in Hong Kong, uh, none. So or very little. So really, I think in terms of, if you just look at the, the sort of the administrative element of filing fees, mm. I think Hong Kong is, is very, is a very competitive jurisdiction at the moment, which, which is good. The next thing really is the level and, and complexity of regulation. I mean, any jurisdiction, certainly on the private fund side, you want to be operating in a well-regulated jurisdiction, but where the, the regulation and the compliance is not prohibitive because that becomes restrictive. Um, and as Christina alluded to, I think we're finally there where we've now got a structure where the previous restrictions that were on it when it was launched have been rolled back. Uh, so really there, for example, are no investment restrictions at all. And I think that was one thing when the scheme was originally launched that actually did put off quite a lot of uh, private funds because there was a restriction on the type of underlying investments that has been removed. Um, I, I think one thing that is absolutely crucial to make, and Christina made the point, is the sort of the, how, is, how are these products regulated? Who is regulated? There tends to be a tendency in the private fund space that if you're dealing with Hong Kong, uh, historically, there's a feeling that actually there is a, perhaps the, the SFC have overreached into the private fund sector compared to some of the other jurisdictions. Um, and it's more uh, private fund managers feel perhaps they're, they're being regulated in a manner not too dissimilar to retail funds. This is not the case. Um, and, and as Christina mentioned, the regulatory focus is on the key operators, the manager, the custodian and the directors. And if you look at any of the developed jurisdictions, even in Europe, if you're setting up a private fund in Europe, the regulators in Europe are basically, it's the same approach. I mean, they are sort of, they, you know, the, the key operators need to fulfill certain key criteria. So the product itself is not regulated. So a private fund is not going to be subject the level of regulation that I think the private fund industry have assumed in the past. That's not the case. There will be some ongoing regulatory filings when changes are made, um, and, uh, but they're quite light. And I think that if you're organized and you can appoint administrator to do that, it's not burdensome. Of course, if you change the investment manager, that's a key operator, then the SFC will be no. involved in that. But really, that sort of change does not occur often. And the same thing goes to the, to the custodian. The next thing that, um, again, is sort of key and almost tends to be at the top of the list is tax. Um, I mean, and Florence has basically explained, you know, that we've basically the concerns over tax that previously had, which again were an inhibitor to using Hong Kong in this vehicle, have now been removed. So I think in terms of, you know, the, the, the concerns around the tax position, was it certain, what are the risks? You don't have to put disclaimers in your offering document, which are going to put off investors now about the tax. It's clear the government have made a decision. 
the inland revenue have adopted it. So from a tax position, that you were, there is now equivalence with the offshore jurisdictions. Um, time to market, any fund manager setting up in any jurisdiction wants to be able to get the product out mm -hmm. fast. Um, uh, and even though it's, it's, it's been challenging to raise capital at the moment, time to market is, is, uh, is an important issue. And I can confirm uh, to the audience that, uh, that time to market in, in terms of dealing with the SFC, it, it, you know, it is good. You're, you're talking about sort of a, sort of a two week period I mean, if your documents and your application is in order, deacons have handled the number of applications. The SFC, as Christina mentioned, is focusing on the certificate of incorporation. Um, and the SFC even have a template for that. So really the process of dealing with the, with the SFC and the fact that it's a one-stop arrangement where the SFC will, will also engage with the company's registry, the process of establishment now is straightforward. Uh, the, the offer document is a key document, and that's the thing that investors see. Uh, and that offer document uh, is not subject to the SFC's prior review and approval. All that needs to be done is that document needs to be filed with the SFC. But you need to ensure that the disclosures are appropriate because fund managers are subject to the FNCC obligations. But the, the fund, the prospectus is not something that the SFC is going to be giving comment on. They're not going to be approving it. So really, the prospectus is not, uh, is not approved. In terms of another issue, location of operational infrastructure. Um, if you are a Hong Kong based manager, you really ought to be looking at this particular structure because you're based here, your operations are here. Um, there really is no reason not to explore this particular structure if you're currently at the moment using another op using an offshore jurisdiction. Um, at the really, you ought to look at you ought to look at this going forward. Another thing is market access opportunities. I think this is going to be key, and we'll come on and talk a few a little bit later. But if, you're, you, have, if you have a Hong Kong domicile product, and this uh, going forward with the sort of initiatives uh, with the Greater Bay Area, if that is going to give greater market access, then this is going to be a significant benefit and a significant reason from a capital raising perspective to why you need to use this, this vehicle. Two more points. You want to be in a jurisdiction with a sound legal system. And I think what it goes beyond, it's beyond doubt that sort of Hong Kong is a, is, is a, has a sort of sound and well-run uh, legal system. The final thing, and it is a bit sensitive, but I'm going to say it. When you're looking at a jurisdiction, you want to be somewhere where there is a certain amount of political stability. I mean, unfortunately, I think we all know that Hong Kong has got some very bad press recently. There's a sort of in the international press in terms of this political situation. I think we just need to put that behind us and look forward uh, in terms of uh, sort of getting back to, uh, to sort of business as usual. And, and in fact, frankly, uh, I have seen very little impact on the sort of, you know, the asset management industry from a sort of a business operation perspective. So I think in terms of the 10 rationales you've got to think about, uh, we're, we, we have them all. And all I would just uh, conclude with the whole evolution of the OFC, uh, for those of you who are parents and have young children, I think the analogy is <laughs> when, you st when you go on a, a trip, you have children in the back seat, and after five minutes they ask, are, you th are we there yet? Um, I can finally say that with the OFC, yes, we are there now. Uh, with the amendments that have been made to facilitate this structure, so really, even if you don't end up using it, there may be some reason why you want to maintain an offshore fund or some of your funds offshore. At the very least, as part of your due diligence, you now need to be looking at the Hong Kong OFC. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jeremy, uh, for that experience sharing. Now that you know, OFC is very versatile and um, it's very cost effective as well. So, Franco. Now, uh, having listened to the comments from uh, Christina, Florence and Jeremy, what do you think of the OFC regime from a user perspective? Thank you, King. Um, after I learned that I have a chance to uh, speak in this panel today, I have taken the liberty to conduct a mini survey uh, among a circle of 30 plus hedge fund managers based in Hong Kong about this topic. Mm -hmm. And I heard very good comments. Uh, people are very encouraged to see this you know, major breakthrough for Hong Kong and we are you know, happy to see that finally Hong Kong has become a viable option. Um, so among the positive comments, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that first, you know, the more frequently uh, heard comments include, first of all, 
cost savings. You know, one less jurisdiction means less legal fees. Mm. Okay, no one likes to pay legal fees, sorry, Jerry. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> lower cost. Um, and secondly, uh, uh, we also see increased operational efficiency because you no longer need to run an offshore board when people are a thousand miles away and 11 hours behind you, all these, right? So removing all these are, uh, are helpful. Uh, we also noticed uh, in terms of regulations, we see uh, greater flexibility in the regulatory requirements. Uh, so that is also very welcome, um, especially in the latest edition uh, of the uh, revision. So that, that has been very uh, well received. Last but not the least, uh, the latest reform in the uh, unified tax system is also something that everyone mentioned. Uh, of course, you know, very welcome. And in particular, for those that are involved in private equity or real estate, they are also quite excited and also eagerly waiting for details coming out with regards to the carry interest concession. Uh, I, I guess we'll get to that a bit later. Yeah. <laughs> so all these are great points, right? And um, for and that, that is the reason why people are looking into it in detail, right? And in, in, in uh, considering all these uh, little details, when people are going through the, you know, the learning process, the learning curve uh, for this uh, new structure, some of the considerations that people are still thinking about would include the following. I know some, are, some may be valid, some are pure commercial concerns, uh, some could be based on misunderstanding. So I guess today would be a great opportunity for us to uh, clarify and perhaps uh, dispel some of the myths. Um, but anyway, here they are. First of all, this one is more commercial. A lot of people say that uh, global investors, you know, as of now, are still more familiar with Cayman. So going for a structure that the clients are more familiar with would make the process simpler. So that, that is really commercial, right? And it, it probably would take time. So when a time when people are more familiar with it, more pioneers have done it, then they would more seriously uh, consider doing it as well. Okay, so that's number one. Secondly, it's, it's quite interesting, it's about legal cost. People know that without uh, the payment cost, uh, the total legal bill probably would be smaller. However, there were some questions in regards to uh, you know, the other areas of legal cost. For example, when it comes to cost associated with negotiating the prime brokerage agreements, the repo, ESDA, all these agreements, because this is new jurisdic uh, jurisdictional agreement, right? So new things probably would cost more. So they're not sure about what the net effect will be. Would it really be that big of a saving or part of that would be offset by the other cost that might be higher? So that is a question mark. Um, thirdly, I think in terms of um, um, private funds, uh, managers, a lot of them, you know, they have been managing private funds all along. So when it comes to having to have the funds uh, registered with or filing with, or, 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 or uh, you know, get approval from the SFC, uh, they are not familiar with it. So they're not certain about what kind of implication would there be, would there be anything that are unexpected down the road so this unfamiliarity uh, makes people, you know, uh, some of them want to think a little bit more, wait and see. And the same applies to IRD, uh, because even though OFC or LPF, uh, we, we know that they can be exempt from um, tax. Uh, however, they still need to file a tax return, right? Probably a new return, but anyway, they still need to file it. So they are unfamiliar with it. So that's why people want to see how others do it. <laughs> they can have more certainty about how, what the outcome would be, right? And um, last but not the least, um, we also have uh, people saying that, uh, it, it probably a little bit far-fetching, but anyway, uh, because it's a new thing. So uh, even though Hong Kong practices common laws, uh, there's no formal case law in regards to this Hong Kong structure per se. So if there are legal disputes down the road, uh, there might be a little bit more uncertainty as to if that legal dispute happens around a Cayman structure. So these are the key items that I heard from people. There was one item that I didn't include on the list. That was uh, a lot of people say that, um, you know, ever since the OFC was introduced, 
two years ago, we have been witnessing a lot of US-China tension, right? So the atmosphere for Hong Kong managers to uh, present or promote a Hong Kong structure, a new one, to overseas investors, especially US investors, uh, might, might be uh, relatively more difficult than usual in this particular period of time. But uh, with the latest development, you know, new president was elected in the US, etc. I didn't have a chance to rerun my mini survey, but anyway, I hope uh, that would, uh, you know, become less of an issue down the road. You know, if we take a, if we take a longer term view, yeah. So these are a few of the considerations on people's mind, and uh, probably, you know, we we can take today as a good opportunity to uh, clarify and dispel some of those. Yeah, um, it is great to have the collective feedback from you, Franco, uh, and the 30 plus Hong Kong based uh, hedge fund managers that you spoke to. Uh, uh, and, you know, we also have a limited partnership fund structure, right? That, that can be considered by uh, the uh, alternative fund managers. We can cover that uh, uh, in, in a bit more detail later. But let me go back to Christina, yes. Jeremy, and Florence to mm -hmm. see if um, you have any comments on the feedback that uh, Franco received for, from his peers. Uh, maybe we'll start with Christina first. Yeah, I, I think, you know, on the unfamiliarity with the SFC, actually, uh, I, I think uh, it's probably Jeremy has the first-hand experience, but in a way, uh, we we duly recognize it's a private fund vehicle. Mm. And, and in a way, um, we don't interfere with uh, your investment strategy. So the focus is, is more on really, you know, your, your FMP. You know, if you are a clean record, your directors are not, not a bankrupt or no criminal mm. record. I, I think these are the basic basic actually uh, checking. And, and, and also, you know, I think there's some misunderstanding about whether we regulate delegation mm -hmm. to uh, other um, uh, outside Hong Kong, you know, all these are not uh, really prevented or, or prohibited by our rules. And, and there's no pivoting or, uh, or post filing, you know, require even if you, you delegate to a, an offshore jurisdiction. So, so I, I think, you know, actually from my, uh, currently we, we have more, you know, private OFC registered than, than public mm. at the moment. You know, first of all, um, we already have some single fund uh, private OFCs and some with sub funds. And, and some of the public fund managers also use the same umbrella to put private funds mm. in, in, you know, under the umbrella. So it could be quite flexible. And, yeah. and in, in a way for, for the private fund is, it, you, you can set it up first and then, you know, add the sub fund later or, or really when you submit the application, there is no need to, to um, submit the prospectus. So you can, you know, launch a fund later on and, and it's just a filing. And ongoing supervision is, is also, you know, just on the major changes of, of the operators or the instrument of incorporation. And then it's just the filing of the annual report, et cetera. So in a way, you know, I hope um, people will, uh, you know, if you are based or already SFC licensed, you should not be scared about SFC. I think, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's just, uh, I, I think in a way, um, consider the cost saving and, and also, you know, the effectiveness, uh, efficiency, et cetera. And I, I think from an investor perspective, understand, uh, fully understand the, 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 the US ten China tension, but, but I think as a vehicle, you know, there are a lot of, mainland investors and other investors who, who you know, should be uh, confident in, in really investing in, in a Hong Kong vehicle. And, and I hope that, you know, with time, um, we could have more take up. And I think the legal uncertainty is probably, uh, Jeremy can comment on, but, but I don't think it, it should be a major concern because, you know, Hong Kong is a common law and very well known of uh, the rule of law, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, for commercial disputes, you know, it's, it's best to be resolved here because actually if the manager is here, it's very likely that the, 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 the legal lawsuit will be under the Hong Kong law already. So, so I, I don't see that, you know, having a Cayman structure would, would help you yeah, avoid that at all. So, 
So oh, that, that's my comment. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Christina. Now, Jeremy, um, you have anything further to add? Uh, well, no, other, I, I, yeah. I think it's a good, uh, I think, frankly, we didn't know that you were going to canvas uh, some you know, sort of 30 uh, private fund managers, but I think it's a good, I mean, thanks for doing that. And it's interesting to get that feedback, a lot of which is, is, is understandable. Um, but I, I think in terms of just the sort of key messages, I mean, or you, you're right. I mean, there is confusion because it, it's new. There's a concern around the level of, uh, of uh, SFC regulation. But let there be no doubt, and we and you've all heard it today from Christina, this product is is not subject to significant SFC regulation, if if, if any. It's, it's around the the key providers to it, and I think that that has been in the past. Um, I guess a reason why managers have looked at uh, jurisdictions, offshore jurisdictions, where it's been a regulatory light touch. But I think if you look at the world today and what's happening, is that even those developed offshore jurisdictions which previously had a regulatory light touch, they're all now having to introduce additional measures, uh, regulatory measures to deal with, you know, whether it's sort of substance or any uh, or anything else, such that this is the new norm. I mean, you know, it, it, if you're going to be looking for a jurisdiction where you don't have any regulation at all, then maybe you look at, you maybe want to be going to Labawan or something else. <laughs> right? But we're not talking about this, this sort of, these sort of jurisdictions. And also, I think we need to be, this is not intended, uh, we're not talking about the demise of the Cayman Islands. I mean, Cayman is a very developed jurisdiction. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's well regulated and, and it's got a lot of history to it. And so we're not saying um, that don't use Cayman. I think the message really is that you don't need to use Cayman if you don't want to, because there is a viable alternative here. I think in terms of legal precedent, that is interesting because even in the uh, the offshore jurisdictions, if you look back at the last financial crisis, two thousand and eight, uh, actually a lot of the the sort of the, the 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 funds which got into financial difficulty and resulted in um, legal proceedings, there was not clear legal judicial precedent to sort of to deal with some of those issues, and so the, the concern should not necessarily be around legal precedent what we have in hong kong i mean this is set up under a statute you know uh under sort of under statute so in terms of ring fencing of liability it's guaranteed under under, under statute so i think the thing is if you don't have confidence about hong kong as a as a as, an, as a legal jurisdiction you shouldn't be here and I, I but i i think that really that is not what we're uh, not what we're talking about um the other thing i think in terms of uh investor choice you're right i think in, some investors may definitely have a preference for a particular offshore jurisdiction. So you need so you need to engage with your investor base and make sure you don't pick a jurisdiction in the beginning, which is going to be uh, problematic. But again, my experience uh, increasingly has been that when if you pick a jurisdiction where actually some of the key operators are subject to more regulation where they otherwise wouldn't, investors like that. They, investors want to know that their money is being managed by uh, an investment manager, which is subject to a certain yeah. amount of standard and regulation. Important. They want to ensure that directors of the product um, that, that are subject to some level of regulatory vetting and approval. So actually, the directors who, who make the you know, appointments and play a role in the structure, uh, you know, that they're appropriately qualified and that they're under obligations to act, uh, you know, their fiduciaries, due care and skill. So I think actually the sort of, to the extent that there is this sort of, well, there is clearly regulation of key operators, that is a selling point from a due diligence perspective because investors, particularly, you know, the, the professional investors we're talking about, institutional investors, they, they, they want that. So I think all of the, it's interesting, the feedback that, that, you, that you have ascertained it's all, I think, understandable and relevant. And we're going to hear in a minute, particularly the tax. I mean, basically, if there's a tax uncertainty, you're not going to use something. And there previously was. Now there isn't. So, um, and just the, the last point, I mean, the proof will be in the actual, um, you know, how this develops. Um, and so if, you know, if uh, people are putting in applications and they feel, oh, this is onerous and this, this product is being regulated, call Christina. 
have it <laughs> from Christine. Actually, Christina. yeah, we we do encourage um, you know um, uh, dialogue and and discussion or con prior consultation with the SFC anytime. You know, if you are you know before you make any submission, actually, we we are free to you know call me or, or any of my team. Yes, great. great um, yeah. It's the last point I would say on um, on on sort of legal fees. Well, basically, you, whichever law firm you choose, you need to have a relationship with your law firm. The, 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 the one thing, and I, and I hope I don't regret saying this, the one thing that is negotiable is, is the legal fees. <laughs> oh, we're there's good, we're good to hear that. And we it. <laughs> no, there's some of my partners back in the office who are not going to be happy about it. The, the fees you pay to the government, etc., are not negotiable. So I think, actually, you'll find you've got to have a relationship, whichever legal service provider you use, right? So that your relationship, talk to them. And then actually, uh, if, if you if you start, if you change a lot of things based on the original instructions, these are going to escalate. If you know what you're doing and you're, uh, and, and basically you're organized, sit down with your legal counsel at, at, at the beginning, have the discussion around fees, as an ongoing, and, and I think that you know, there's an important. It's important to be transparent about fees, and I, and I do think that sometimes you know, there's no point uh, giving a low fee estimate and giving a big bill at the end. It's better to be realistic if you need to be, but engage. As I said, I mean, there, there are different approaches uh, out there, but I think at the end of the day, you've got to use uh, a, a service providers you're comfortable with. So 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 discuss it. Agree agree what you want to do. Try not to change it. And then uh, take it forward from that. But frankly, what, you know, there's no reason I, that I think overall there's going to be there, there should be a cost saving unless something dramatically changes in the in that in that process. So that's all I would. Can I just add? Actually, there's no legal or, or SFC does not require legal advisors to to you know make submissions. So, but I, I'm not you know discouraging the use of. Um, Legal law, you know, services, but but we are quite flexible. I, we have seen some private funds; they 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 can do it in house or with some assistance. Or, you know, that could be um, reducing some of the fees or, or focusing on some, you know, narrow down some of the the, the legal work. That could also be uh, cost saving. So, as you said, you know, engage with 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 Jeremy, but but it, it's not a must. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Yeah. I, I was going to invite you to the Deacons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I leave it to managers as to whether they feel comfortable. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, but tax. Yes, I think tax is also tax. an important consideration. Tax has been um, uh, all, always mentioned. It's not the high on the agenda because first of all, you need to have a business case about tax. Um, uh, it's, it's always a, a, a misconception that one sets up something in England, then we don't need to pay tax. That's not correct. Uh, under the current environment, there's nowhere to hide. We cannot hide because of common reporting standard, automatic exchange of information. Now, the reality is the fund manager team need to be based somewhere. If the manager is based in Hong Kong, and you set up a Cayman fund, of course, the Cayman fund can seek to enjoy the unified fund exemption. However, the unified fund exemption condition for a Cayman fund, I don't want to go to the details, are te technically a bit uh, longer than those for OFC. So that's uh, uh, num number one. And uh, number two is uh, in terms of tax filing, uh, uh, if, I mean, we have not, uh, I mean, for an OFC is very new and limited partnership fund is even more new. Uh, now, in terms of tax filing, if the fund is tax exam, you just fill it in and say tax exam under the law. Now, uh, if you look at other jurisdictions, I would say in Singapore, you uh, not only need to do tax filing for the tax exempt fund, they also need to do filing to, to monitor you. You also, before you claim the tax exemption, you need to apply to the MAS for approval under the 13X or 13R regime. And also they have a minimum expenditure requirement uh, like uh, 200,000 Singapore dollar, as well as uh, three professionals. Now, of course, um, if you run a uh, operation in Hong Kong, probably three people is not a high, high, con too, too difficult to meet a condition. But ne nevertheless, when you when, when you set up the uh, operation, you probably need to think about your cash flow, you know. So, so in order to, in, in Hong Kong, we don't have a, an application process. 
uh, all along the, uh, the tax exemption in Hong Kong runs on a self-disciplined manner because um, we are all professionals here. So um, the tax authorities have uh, certain faith and trust on the professional uh, fund managers that you would run your business appropriately and, uh, and in compliance mode. Now, what I would like to emphasize is if one goes for a Cayman fund, uh, in particular for a Cayman hedge fund, then it's quite difficult for the hedge fund, the Cayman fund to um, well, uh, apply for a tax rate certificate uh, as opposed to a Hong Kong set up private OFC. Because for a Hong Kong private OFC, uh, conveniently you can uh, have uh, Hong Kong directors, you have uh, Hong Kong um, fund managers, pipeline license. So um, you can you need to think about the long term. If um, the uh, after tax profit of the fund is higher, then probably the profit allocation to the manager would be higher as well. <laughs> so so uh, th so that should be an incentive for one to consider the location of uh, the domicile of the fund. Oh, that's a very helpful clarification uh, for us. Um, you know, we have heard uh, a lot from our experts that uh, now the OFC regime is really very flexible and uh, cost effective. Uh, it is uh, quite encouraging. Uh, we also talked about uh, limited partnership fund. Maybe I'll start with uh, Jeremy first. So now does Hong Kong offer an alternative domicile for you know, limited partnership structure? Yes, thank you, Pete. Yeah, very much so. I, I mean, I, I think the, what we now have is a Hong Kong limited partnership on a, on a level playing field with the offshore jurisdictions. Um, and really that there's, there is no, there's nothing that, you, that this, this Hong Kong limited partnership cannot be used for uh, compared to what you could do in an offshore jurisdiction. So the, you know, the, you know, primarily this is a sort of a private equity uh, structure historically and so the private equity managers will be very familiar with it if you if you've got a, a sort of a hedge fund manager you're, you're probably you're still going to be looking at the um the the ofc structure but certainly for the for the um private equity managers yes this is a it's it, you'll be familiar with the limited partnership structures in other jurisdictions hong kong is now on a level playing field to that again i think an important point to make is that for the uh, this limited Hong Kong limited partnership, it's not subject to SFC regulation. Uh, actually, in fact, the SFC uh, really may not be involved at all in this structure. And the only the only reach uh, that the SFC may have is that if the investment management discretion of the limited partnership is being undertaken. Uh, in Hong Kong, then the entity doing that needs to have a Type 9 license. So, which means again, the SFC is regulating the, um, the I guess, the investment manager for that. Um, but if there is, if there is not a, uh, a sort of a Hong Kong investment manager, then this is not going to sort of, this is not really going to have any sort of any regulatory uh, overview uh, with from the SFC. The other point to note is, is, is also on the distribution side is because if you are in Hong Kong carrying on a business of distributing and so marketing and promoting a, uh, a limited partnership, uh, then that uh, activity constitutes dealing in securities because the limited partnership will be caught by our definition of collective investment scheme. So if you're promoting a collective investment scheme, a limited partnership, mm. even to professional investors, um, and, and, you're, and you're based in Hong Kong when you do that, then you'll need you know, the, the entity engaging in the promotion needs to be licensed by the SFC, but the product itself does not. So again, it is a, um, it, you know, it's very new, you know, it, to, you know, to Hong Kong, but the number have been uh, set up already. I think there's sort of growing interest, I think from the private equity uh, world, I mean, and they've been very active um, associations which have been lobbying for many years, I think, so the Hong Kong government and the regulators to try and give a vehicle of equivalence, um, and also from a sort of a, you know, Florence will comment on the tax, but, you know, and to sort of deal with that. And, I, and I, again, I think we're, we're pretty much, we're, we're pretty much there. Maybe a couple of things on the tax just need to be still uh, fully resolved. But other than that, we, we have it. The process to, to establish and register very quick uh, the, the, you know, very, uh, very reasonable. I mean, the, just a sort of a filing, a filing fee 
uh, paid to the company registry. So an application fee of just under 500 Hong Kong dollars uh, and a registration fee of 2,555. Um, and if you take Christina's advice and don't have any legal advice, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, as we, we do now have a sort of a structure which really is on a par with the, the offshore jurisdictions for the private equity uh, industry. So that that's, that now puts us in a very good place. Okay, Th thanks for that uh, clarification, um, Christina. Yeah, any thing to add? No, I, I think this you know uh, this is all another very important initiative, and mm. I, I think it's complementary to the OFC structure. Mm. And now we've uh, finally we we got the the, the LPF fix, and, and with the OFC now we we do have now you know uh, I think uh, a very good choice of uh, legal vehicles for fund managers and operators here to operate, mm. and and so um, and you could even you know have a combination. Of, of both, uh, I think Florence, I heard you have some, you know, you suggested before some good ideas for, for the fund industry, especially some of the mainland based, you know, mm -hmm. private funds that mm -hmm. may be, you know, investing offshore, etc. Mm -hmm. That could be a, a very useful uh, vehicle. And, mm -hmm. and I think as Jeremy said, this, we, it's only when, when the, the manager is is licensed, then you know our regulation comes in, but through the the core conduct, but not not the product itself. So, okay. so but so that's why uh, I I really hope that um, the industry could could make good use of it and and and, and explore. You know, at least I know um, it will take time, but but I, I think it's time to change and and think seriously about using Hong Kong. Yes, absolutely. Now, uh, we mentioned tax uh, quite a few times. So, uh, you know, with this LPF, any new tax incentive? Yes. Uh, I remember uh, back in 2015, uh, we, uh, I, I worked uh, in, uh, with the FSDC. I led a working group and we issued a report on limited partnership fund. Yeah. So, it's uh, very gratifying that uh, after four and a half years, we. Yeah, finally, we're there. We have learned <laughs> of uh, LPF. Now, uh, I think the good news is uh, nowadays, uh, the new unified fund exemption that was effective uh, last April um, is launched that it would cater for funds uh, regardless of the fund central bank control in Hong Kong or not in Hong Kong, regardless of the size of the funds, regardless of its legal structure, then uh, provide certain conditions are satisfied. The limited partnership fund would be tax exempt. Now, in, in fact, um, when we um, discuss um, the, the conditions of, uh, of the Unified fund exemption. The industry has many rounds of discussion with the government uh, authorities, and we believe the conditions are very user friendly. Number one, uh, it does not matter whether your directors are in Hong Kong or in Hong Kong, your investment committee members are in Hong Kong or not in Hong Kong. It would not affect the Hong Kong tax exemption eligibility of the fund. Uh, actually, uh, what is important, of course, is the qualifying transactions. The law and um, uh, um, have a list of uh, qualifying transactions. Now, for private equity funds, actually, it has um, added um, the shares of unlisted companies and also debt securities in related to um, unlisted companies uh, are generally uh, acceptable, except if the uh, target company holds uh, more than 10% of Hong Kong real estate. So yeah, the, the government policy is not to encourage private equity to uh, trade or uh, invest in Hong Kong private companies. However, uh, infrastructure has been carved out mm -hmm. from the definition of real estate. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in terms of holding period, um, it requires the target to be held before disposal for at least two years. And in case that the, uh, the holding period is less than uh, two years, uh, fear not, as long as the fund does not have a controlling stake at the target, then the disposal game will still be exempt. To the extent that you hope the fund holds the target for less than two years and has controlling stake at the target, there still be no um, tax consequences if the private company hold less than 50% of the value of its uh, a, a short-term asset. So that means uh, very, I would say most, most private equity fund managers will feel at liberty to run their business. Because uh, in particular, uh, for many private equity fund managers, 
established in Hong Kong, actually their footprint is not just investing in Hong Kong, probably you know, in, in the region in particular, in mainland China. So they would have liberty to choose their target. And we understand most of the uh, many, many uh, private equity managers actually would have a long holding period of more than two years. So, so um, I would say that, um, uh, so that's the first condition, qualifying transaction. The second condition is very, very attractive is um, the fund manager of such an LPF needs not be an SFC license manager. Now, of course, if it's li licensed, take. However, should the, the manager's activity in Hong Kong do not fall into the regulated activity of an SFO, then the manager need not be SFC licensed, provided the fund for tax purposes is a qualified investment fund. Now, there are some conditions, but for a genuine uh, for, um, private equity fund, that should not be a problem. And last but not least, is there's an incidental 5% uh, uh, income tax. So if the Hong Kong source incidental income of a uh, uh, LPF um, exceeds 5% of the total trading receipts of the LPF for that year, then that part of um, uh, Hong Kong source uh, incidental income would be subject to tax. However, that can be monitored. Okay, so 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 that means an LPF can be uh, can enjoy Hong Kong tax exemption quite, I would say, easily. Now, of course, many people would then have this million dollar question of uh, carry interest taxation. Mm -hmm. And our financial secretary has announced in the budget speech in February this year that Hong Kong is to introduce a highly competitive and attractive uh, regime for uh, carry interest concession in the current uh, year of assessment, in the current tax year. Now, the co uh, consultation for the proposed concession uh, was launched in uh, early August this year, and the consultation lab. And I understand that government is working busily to uh, draft the bill. We look forward to uh, seeing the bill. Uh, now, uh, at this moment, I mean, this is not a session on Karen's concession details. So in due course, if FSCC holds another session, I'd be more than happy to um, to, to explain, but I think, uh, so that means with an, if, if we sit back, we have a Hong Kong established limited partnership fund, we have a Hong Kong based fund manager. First of all, you don't need to go to Macau or go to <laughs> Bangkok to have board meeting. Okay, so this is practically very, very convenient. You can sit in Hong Kong if you like, or you can travel if you can, or if you wish. Okay, and, and very importantly is, uh, the SPV of the limited partnership fund uh, can also be tax exempt if some conditions are satisfied. So that means the LPF and the S SPV all as a bundle are tax exempt, and not only that. And if they, because you can prove your commercial substance in Hong Kong, then the fund and SPV can also get tax residence certificate from the tax authorities in Hong Kong. That means you can the LPF and the SPV can enjoy tax treaty protection. Now that's very very important, and also that would that means indirectly it helps the returns of the fund, mm. and indirectly help the carry interest distribution uh, to the fund managers. So um, uh, Christina actually uh, mentioned about uh, the idea I have had regarding mm -hmm. using uh, OFC and uh, LPF not only of course for investment in Hong Kong or in the region, but because of the development of uh, the GPA. Uh, this is not a session on GBA, but uh, in GBA, many people focus on uh, Wealth Management Connect. Of course, that's uh, very, very important. But in fact, in Circular 95, uh, issued uh, in May, and also there's another circular issued by four regulators in uh, at, at end of June. Uh, actually, there are some paragraphs about uh, private funds. Um, in, in fact, uh, in the nine cities of the GPA, uh, QFLP, QDLP, and QDIE would be highly promoted, and they would use that to connect with the other two uh, special administrative regions, i.e. Hong Kong and Macau. So I'm thinking, and in fact, I'm working on some project where a Hong Kong OFC uh, or LPF can serve as either a master feeder fund with a mainland China base, a QFLP or QDLP, or can serve as a parallel fund. So this would be a very, uh, I would say, a good 
uh, initiative. Uh, because Hong Kong has safe harbor tax exemption for, for funds, uh, China, uh, even for QDIE or QFLP, it does not mean it's tax free. Okay, <laughs> so, so we need to make use of um, uh, uh, certain structure to make, make sure that overseas investors, they would be able to um, maximize the overall return from the investment through a fund manager. Oh, yeah, um, thank, thank you so much, uh, Florence, uh, you know, for, for, for that uh, exciting initiative yeah. sharing with us. Um, well, on that note, I have to ask all the speakers the, the very important question. What are the key challenges and opportunities for Hong Kong to become a funds domicile of choice now that we have two very flexible schemes? Maybe uh, I need to go back to Franco you know, to hear uh, from him and the market, you know, what are, what are the, uh, your views? Sure, thank you, King. Uh, I mean, obviously, we, 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 we see a very exciting opportunity ahead of us. Uh, now we have all the groundwork you know, laid out. So um, it is probably going to open up a new chapter that is very encouraging and exciting. Um, in terms of timing, uh, like always, right, changing behavior uh, will take time. And especially when you have, for example, payment that has been a popular choice for many decades and you have the whole system built around it, right? So, I mean, people are quite used to it. And we also have some very aggressive competitors next to us, mm -hmm. right? You know, I, I was told by my friends that in Singapore, uh, they literally write you a check if you go for the SBCC structure, uh, cash subsidies, right? I mean, all of these. So it's... Um, it's, it's, it's not easy to immediately change everything. And, and I think uh, from all the speakers, uh, all, all the speeches today, I, I know that we also have a realistic expectation on the timeline, right? But it's heading to the right direction. Mm. Um, taking the um, 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 Hong Kong example, right? I think we, we still have a major advantage, okay? In terms of uh, facing our competition, uh, that is our access to the China market. Uh, if you take the uh, retail funds example, uh, you know, we have Hong Kong unit trust, you know, a Hong Kong structure in place for many years. We also have a pretty sizable retail fund market in Hong Kong. All the global mutual funds giants, they have meaningful presence in Hong Kong all along, right? But um, in the past, uh, just a few years back, you, if you walk into a <laughs> bank on the street, you, you look at the product shelf, you probably will see most of the funds being used on mm. payments, right? And uh, it was reasonable, you know, easy to understand because, you know, behavior continues, right? It was a legacy reason people keep continuing doing what they do. And uh, without a major incentive, <clears throat> people may not change the behavior immediately. So that is the reason why we only saw a change of behavior a few years back when we had the yeah, mutual recognition of funds policy introduced. And from that point onward, as a fund management company, you have to ask yourself, are you interested in the opportunity to change a 7 million people market to become a 1.3 billion people market? You have to ask yourself, you have to rethink. And uh, if that is something that uh, fit into your business objective, then you have a very good reason to change your behavior. So I think, uh, you know, in, 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 in the current uh, situation, we probably may explore uh, whether, like what uh, Florence had mentioned, whether we can have certain um, access program of some sort that can allow fund, private fund I'm talking mm. about, which currently, if you want to uh, do fundraising in China, probably the most popular way is to do it through QDRP, which has a high threshold. Uh, but if we can offer some easier access program for funds that adopt OFC or LPF structure, uh, if nationwide is too big or takes too long, then probably just GBA, for example. If there's an easier access program uh, given to structures using OFC or LPF, I believe that would be a game changer. That would be a game changer. Much more effective than giving out cash subsidies, I believe. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, monetary incentive is always uh, welcome. I fully agree with you that having access to market opportunities matters most. Um, so, um, Christina, yeah. although, you know, we don't have time yeah. to talk about Wealth Management Connect in detail, yeah. but can you give us a quick comment on the regulatory funds? 
Well, I, I, I think, you know, Franco, um, we, we do agree you, you need the access or, or the incentives mm -hmm. to, you know, for, for people to choose uh, Hong Kong. And, and I think, um, you know, the GBA Connect, uh, the Wealth Connect, and would be, you know, a very important uh, uh, initiative as well, because, you know, that would be um, uh, more open in, in terms of their, the, the plan is there will not be a product, part, product although it's, it's limited to the bank distribution mm. channel, but then um, there will be certain criteria of, you know, low to medium risk, but, but certainly I, I think, you know, the, the plan is that it should be a Hong Kong domicile uh, authorized fund. So, so in a way, um, uh, I think the MA and ourselves have been, you know, sort of consulting the market for, mm. for you know, quite quite a few weeks already about uh, the some of the operational details. So, so I, I think this would be a, a very good opportunity, mm. and I will urge I would urge the um, service providers here and and fund managers to really make good use of, of this um, the Hong Kong platform, whether it's OFC or Unit Trust. And, and also, I think uh, recently, we also got the ETF uh, cross-listing yep. with Sun Jun. And, and actually, that would, um, has, has raised a lot, you know, quite, quite, um, has been quite successful in terms of raising um, uh, new, uh, expanding our ETF market. Because uh, I understand that, you know, for, as for a passive manager, um, the OFC structure could be, you know, uh, have tax savings for some of the Korean or, or you know investors, so so actually now we have more some of uh, a fund manager or ETF manager really would prefer to set up OFC for the distribution, uh, and also you know with the cross listing you can have a feeder fund structure set up in the mainland that fit into the um, the the ETF and mm -hmm. that does not it doesn't matter whether it's OFC or unit trust. So mm -hmm. so I, I think with you know Hong Kong we. We, we have, you know, this unique position and that could enjoy a lot of, uh, uh, these are all pilot, but I, I think we in, in with time, you know, this would help um, to give impetus to the use of uh, Hong Kong funds, you know. Oh, excellent, um, very encouraging indeed. Um, so, Florence, any word on tax? Yes, yes. I want to highlight that uh, whilst we are all very excited about this forthcoming wealth management connect to be implemented because uh, we understand that uh, from market sources <laughs> that uh, a certain draft set of rules have been um, circulated, um, yes. you know, getting communities uh, comment. However, we are, I mean, as a tax practitioner, I would like to highlight that uh, tax is something that we need to really, really iron out. At the moment, mainland individual investors can enjoy individual income tax and VAT exemption on redemption gain of funds, but Distribution income from mutual recognition of funds at the moment under the MLF system, distribution income is subject to 20% IIT in China. So mainland agents of Hong Kong funds at the moment have withholding obligations under the mutual fund recognition regime. Okay. However, under the Wealth Management Connect, will in so how would this um, in, uh, income tax uh, matter be re resolved if Will the Hong Kong individual investors have similar China tax treatment? If it is, then who is going to deal with um, the tax withholding, tax filing? Because I think from a customer experience perspective, uh, if you ask retail investors to do tax filing or any paperwork, that might not be very uh, easy to carry out. Okay, so I think this matter needs to be um, ironed out and, 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 and addressed and be very clear yes. so that um, I think also for the service providers, you know, they all understand their obligations. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, Jeremy, uh, last one. Yeah, just my concluding remarks would be uh, the, the asset management industry is a long term, uh, you know, so I would say think long term, think strategically, and be patient. Uh, market access will come. We don't know when full market access will be available, but it will come. And when it does come, we will all benefit. When I say all, that's not just legal, not just tax, not just fund managers, it's also investors. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, we've got quite a lot of questions. I know we, we overrun a bit, uh, but um, if the audience can bear with us for a few more minutes. Um, our first question is for Christina. Uh, could you share a bit on trends of private fund startups in Hong Kong? 
how many new funds are launched yearly, uh, trending up, uh, perhaps in terms of numbers and AUM, etc. Um, actually, I don't have the number of hands, but but I think our like you know the annual survey we did. Um, actually, last year was end of twenty nineteen was what we you know the overall AUM was up twenty percent, and and actually as you know. Um, Hong Kong, about half and half, half are public and pension fund managers, and the West are mm. more uh, the private uh, funds and, and institutional mandate. So, so in a way, uh, I, I think there is generally, you know, an increase in the AUM um, and also uh, I think even licensing. Uh, our licensing numbers go up all the time. So, so you know, uh, I think in general we are still seeing, uh, you know, good upward trend. And even for fund flows, I, I think um, other than the, the March, you know, because of the stress in March and April, I think generally, you know, uh, we we are also seeing quite, you know, stable, you know, positive uh, flows. Yeah. Uh, Christina, you're very popular. I've got uh, one more question for you. Uh, yeah, one of the uh, uh, practitioners would like to check uh, on the LPF regime, see whether there's any requirement for the Hong Kong entity appointed as the investment manager to have tight line uh, license. Or is it okay if the investment management services are carried out by offshore managers and then the Hong Kong manager entity carries out uh, other permissible activities, such as uh, takes direction from offshore managers, performing investment monitoring, etc. Okay, I think for the LPF, there is no requirement for for it to be managed by uh, uh, L Type Nine LC. I think Jeremy just mentioned it could be, you know, uh, uh, but you know, you have some Hong Kong presence, but not not uh, not an uh, not particularly, you know, if if your activities in Hong Kong. Um, constitute uh, regulated activities, then you need a license. But but the LPF itself does not um, require um, uh, a license manager. So, um, can I just add one point? Yeah. One point. Like, yes, sometimes yeah. what you do see is form over substance, and you do see mm -hmm. sometimes uh, structures which are put in place uh, to try and avoid a licensing and and then uh, organizations sailing very close to the wind in terms of is a license required. Uh, I think the SFC have made their position pretty clear is that if you're carrying on a regulated activity in and from Hong Kong, you need to be licensed. So in terms of the, the does the in, in this structure, does the entity in Hong Kong need to be licensed? What is it doing? If it is distributing, it needs to be licensed. If it has investment management discretion, it needs to be licensed for type nine. Investment management discretion means it, it is the entity which has the authority and it is exercising that authority to decide what to buy and sell. So if it is if it is doing something else, then you need then it's not going to need the type nine. But you need to be a little bit cautious when you're when you're when you're looking at this and, and don't try and and game the system and sail too close to the wind. It, frankly, I, it, at the end of the day. If, irrespective of what title you put on an entity, I think it's pretty clear what it does. So you need to get, uh, I would say, well, either speak to your internal legal advisor or your external legal advisor and get clarity in terms of that. Because, because uh, carrying out a regulated activity in Hong Kong without a license, uh, is a criminal offence, and the SFC will take enforcement action. Yeah, but but I think the question is about you know for for whether it's LPF or a private OFC, you can you can delegate. You know, there's no restriction from delegation to an offshore um, manager or, or entity. So so there is you know uh, flexibility there. You know, in terms of uh, the structure itself, but licensing is a separate issue. You can you can only yeah. delegate discretion if you yeah. have it in the first place. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, um, there, there are quite a few questions related to tax, so I'll, I'll try to group them all together. Well, first of all, um, um, what's the tax treatment uh, on carry interest? I think uh, you touched on it uh, earlier, Florence, instance, and also uh, whether OF is, OFC is good for setting up ETFs. Uh, would there be any tax advantages in doing so? All right, so I, I try to explain about the first question. Now, as I, as I said, the carry interest consultation has left and we are uh, the government, we understand they appreciate the feedback from the community. They are analyzing all the suggestions, comments, etc. And we don't know the answer yet now, but we all we have faith in our finance secretary's remarks that 
the final regime would be competitive and attractive. Okay, so uh, so uh, now of course there are conditions uh, on like eligible um, caring recipient, eligible transaction, eligible fund, etc. Now, in the carry interest uh, concession, there's a, uh, one, I would say, quite a new initiative from the Hong Kong perspective is a proposed validation by the Hong Kong MA. Mm -hmm. So instead of going to the ILD to knock at the door to say, hey, am I eligible? The first knock at the door would be at the Hong Kong Monetary Authority store, and they would validate. And also something new is also um, uh, throughout the uh, pro process, you know, when the carry is uh, distributed, um, there's an auditor certifying that the very relevant conditions required in the proposed uh, carry concession uh, will or would have been satisfied. So the auditor will need to sign off. So this is something new as well. Um, so we really look forward to that. And I'm sure if it's out, uh, maybe King will um, do you another will something. Nice. <laughs> yeah, something to explain. The second question uh, on um, OFC uh, to be used for ETF. Now, definitely, uh, uh, I would uh, defer to the lawyer to um, uh, 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 explain about the difference between a unit trust and a corporate form of fund. But definitely, if you have a, um, a OFC uh, for ETF, definitely the OFC can be much easier to get a Hong Kong tax rent certificate because of the company. But companies set up in Hong Kong with management and control in Hong Kong, the directors in Hong Kong, manager in Hong Kong would be very easy. For a unit trust, because uh, the unit trust itself is not a person, the beneficial owners of the unit trust are actually the unit holders. So in terms of uh, uh, getting tax rent certificates, there could be a more paperwork. It's still doable, but more paperwork. Uh, last but not least, uh, trading of uh, ETF on the exchange would be exempt from stamp duty. So that's a good, good news. Yeah, I, I think I understand that for some uh -huh. overseas or international investors, because yes. if it's a company, it's like a stock. Yeah. So so they may have a better tax savings if mm -hmm. they are trading in a stock mm -hmm. instead of a, a trust fund. Yeah, because uh, in some countries, they don't have the concept of, oh. you know, they don't have the, uh, not concept, they don't have the convention having uh, a um, a fund, a, a, a marketable fund in the form of a trust. Yeah, that's yes. true. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I'll try to uh, combine a couple of questions together uh, for uh, Franco, uh, because um, it is market related. Uh, but um, you know, we all know that MAS has uh, offered uh, some incentive for fund managers to uh, set up VCC uh, in uh, Singapore. Uh, so far, they've launched, you know, more than 80 new products. But as you mentioned earlier, you know, market access is important. So from a practitioner's, practitioner's point of view, um, what would you have to say on that? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, I can only speak for myself on, on, on this one. But uh, anyway, I, I believe uh, market access is um, by far more important than cash subsidies. Not to say that if you give me cash subsidy, I would decline. I would still say thank you, right? <laughs> but uh, it's not really the main point. The main point is about having the product, um, uh, you know, made available to the relevant markets, and that is also the way Hong Kong can really, you know, uh, play to its own strength. You know, our our, our access to China, uh, if we can uh, play to that strength, then I believe it's more important than any subsidy that. For example, other governments like Singapore can give to um, uh, fund managers. Yeah. Okay. One very last question. Then uh, I think um, some hedge fund uh, managers are saying, uh, asking whether uh, LPF uh, can also be a viable legal structure for hedge fund activities. Um, you know, I'm open this question to you know, the. Well, it's, it basically, it's a very flexible structure. And I think that really comes down to you need to speak to your investors in terms of what 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 investment terms are going to be acceptable to them in terms of uh, sort of uh, frequency of, of dealing, frequency of, of payouts. Yeah. And then uh, I think you'll, that will determine which vehicle is, uh, is is more is more suitable. But just but as we mentioned, the, you know the LPF is uh, you know is very flexible. So depending on your investment strategy, what you're investing in, the terms you want to give to your investors, you may well find that that uh, partnership. May, may be of equivalent or uh, or better, but I think that's, you've got to sit down, talk to your investors, talk to your advisors. 
Okay. Because, Thanks. Yeah, maybe sorry. I just I just want to add that actually some people also ask whether OFC can be a close end of fund, mm. and and I I think actually you know that it is possible because although it's called an OFC, but it is actually you know um, it's not a requirement that you must allow redemption. So you could have a limitation or some restrictions on redemption and even, you know, have a, a fixed duration. And even, you know, for, uh, because now the unified fund tax regime, there's no distinction about, you know, whether it's, it's a corporate or a partnership fund, etc. So even for an OFC, you can make your private investment. And, and because we don't have the, the tainting rule is gone. So in a way, even mm -hmm. Even if your OFC invests in some private shares or private investment, then you know, depending on if it's not Hong Kong source, etc., mm -hmm. so you could still get your tax exemption. So, so I think you know, to Jeremy's point, it's really up to where you know what types of unit you know structure that your investors are are really requesting. For you know the set of uh, yeah because uh, OFC yeah. investing in uh, private equity, uh, I would say would also be tax exempt. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, so that, that that's not an issue. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, thanks so much uh, uh, for uh, our speakers uh, in sharing uh, their uh, views and experience. And but uh, last but not least, I want to thank all the uh, audience in participating. Uh, because uh, we still have very high number of participants uh, on the call now. Um, you know, we have a very versatile system, you know, both for OFC and LPF. So um, I think the regulators, the government, uh, you know, have uh, done a lot. So now it's up to you uh, all uh, in the market to uh, help promote this scheme. So uh, thanks so much again for your participation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I may also